Um, they say the average person will spend about 90,000 hours at work over a lifetime. Some say it's about 13 years, and some will say 13 years and two months. But of course, if you are doing that calculation as a Nigerian, you have to account for all the public holidays. <laughs> and it's plenty, it's plenty. And some people are angry that there's no Wednesdays. <laughs> Some people did not come to church today because there's no Wednesday, because they already planned. They planned something for that Wednesday, so Sunday will kind of like make up. So it will be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, instead of Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. But we work a lot. We, we spend a lot of our time and our lives working. Your first thoughts upon waking are usually, usually have to do with work. You know, you're thinking about meetings and deadlines. You're thinking about tasks and projects. You're thinking about schedules. Thinking about rescheduling. You're responding to messages, as you say the Lord's Prayer. You're typing on Slack. <laughs> and you say, God, just there's, then don't let there be traffic this morning. I'm already late. And so you walk all day, everything is nice. Your boss says you are the best work I are ever. And your colleagues, they do surprise celebration for you. So you are the best colleague ever, best teammates. So your work is so good. Um, you come back at night, you ask your kids the ultimate question in life. You ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> of course, you know, they tell you what you want to hear, and you go to bed soundly. Or they don't tell you what you want to hear. But before that, you already told them, and you see, you can be anything you want to be, anything. I'm, I will not be like my parents. It strained us. It can be everything you want to be. And then your son utters that he wants to be um, <laughs> a farmer. <laughs> he said, no, 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 no. You can be everything you want to be except a farmer. He says, oh, we learned about, you know, janitors and all that in school today, Mrs. Akila B, very nice woman. So, Daddy, I want to be a janitor. He said, mm. you can be everything you want to be except a janitor. So after you correct them, you try to try, you go to bed, and you sleep again. And then you wake up the next morning with thoughts of work again, Slack, email, everything, all over again. So this is, this is the, this is the, this would be like cool, okay life. You know, this would be, if everything's like this, all nice, kids are fine, work is fine, teammates are fine, and this would be like TGIM, TGIT, TGIW, TGIT, TGIF. <laughs> everything is good. But how I wish, how you wish, how we all wish that this was how it was. <laughs> I know some people who are, who are living like this, who have this kind of CGI kind of life. But most people, the people I know, people who are my friends, some of people who are here, and some of people that I work with, and some of people that you work with, it's not the same for us. You might just be that guy who went to work for the first time and said, ah, all my life, I've never been at a workplace like this, so everything is perfect, my work colleagues, my everything is saying, all is so good. He just tweeted that, and then before he knew it, five minutes later, he just quickly replied his tweet and said, ah, hello, you can continue to my meal. <laughs> so you might be all so good going for you now, but you know, that what year in this city often becomes something else. And so the stories that I often hear sounds like Ishel Lua's. You see, Ishel Lua is stuck in the job she loves. She's just starting out, and it's a very competitive industry. She's thinking about the proposal she has to make on Tuesday because there's no holiday for her. She didn't sleep well last night and is concerned that if she doesn't do well, she won't receive the promotion she has worked so hard to get. She works around the clock. The CEO of the company will send her messages by 3 a.m. and expect a response ASAP. No rest. She goes to bed every night praying her job would still be there when she woke up the next morning. The stories I hear sound like Nwokocha's. Nwokocha is burnt out. He has to work multiple menial jobs for peanut salaries. He's not just making enough He's not just making enough to make ends meet. He never seems to get ahead. All his bosses don't have a clue of all he's capable of. No one really values or appreciates him. His wife is pregnant and pressuring him to be home more. He's caught between providing for his family 
or being home with his family. He can't do both. And with a spouse who doesn't understand him and kids who don't listen or obey him, home is no better than work. The stories that I hear sound like diligence. Diligence, who at the end of the GC comes to meet me and say, I've got to deal with an assistant whose work is not just up to par, and I need to let her go. The trouble is that she's a single mom, and she needs a job. We've spent the last hour talking about the poor and how to care for them, but I don't know what to do. For the sake of my business, I need to fire her, but if I do, I know I'm going to be putting her out of work. And with the current high unemployment rate in Nigeria, it will be very difficult for her to get another job, especially one that will pay enough. If I keep her, my business suffers. If I let her go, she suffers. What am I supposed to do? The stories I hear sounds like patience. Patience is bored. She is really good at the job. The problem she doesn't want, the problem is that she doesn't want to do it. She doesn't want to do it anymore. Not even because of the backstabbing of his politics and kissing up. She's just bored. Most of her satisfactions are coming off the job. This job is just a stepping stone. Meanwhile, Ife, her elder brother, who has been squatting with her for eight months now, is eager and will do anything he gets, but he can't find anything. Do these experiences resonate with you in some way? This is how I feel. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm thinking. This is how I'm processing all, that, all these stories. This is how I process them every time I hear them. Every time my friend comes to me, I'm tired of me. I'm exhausted of me. I'm burnt out of me. I'm thinking, God said six days a week you should work. A, a God that says that surely must have something to say. God, who put the first man, Adam, in the garden and did not say flex, he did not say live your best life. He did not say make pina coladas, eat pomo for the rest of your life. But he said, walk it. That's what he said, walk it. First thing to the guy, walk it. The garden, walk it. This God must feel strongly about what we spend most of our lives doing. Shouldn't he? He must sense our desire to work. He must sense our disillusionment to work. He must sense our pain and joys at work. He must sense the fruits and fruitlessness of our labor. He should. What does he think of how we spend most of our time? What does he say? A lot, I think, a lot. But today, what he wants to tell us is that your work is a way to love. There's a lot he can say, but the text before us says he wants to say that our work is a way to love. So we resumed last week our series from First Thessalonians that we titled Wait. And last week we talked about sex. Today we are talking about work. And work is a way to love. I just want to show us three things. Work is a way to love. The proposal, the process, and the product. What do we mean? What do I mean when I say the proposal? I mean what do we mean when we say that work is a way to love? That is a proposal. For the process, it means if work is a way to love, how should we work? For the product, I'm saying when work is a way to love, what's the result for us and everyone? So work is a way to love, the proposal. Um, Tina Turner. I'm going to Tina Turner. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. There are many people here who had their hearts broken in the 80s. They should speak up. <laughs> speak up. Dikin Feyi, speak up. Dikin Kemi, speak up. <laughs> Tina Turner sang several great love songs. But there was one that she sang in 1984. What is it called? What? Come on. Oh, my word. I can see that you guys are editing your playlist. Like Pastor Femi said. <laughs> What's love got to do with it? Uh uh. Sweet song. When she was in her 40s, she sang that song. Woman, I don't touch her. <laughs> so, <laughs> she, she must have eaten breakfast for a little bit. Breakfast in the morning, breakfast in the afternoon, breakfast in the night. Every time I see you, breakfast. <laughs> so she put in that lyrics and she says something like, he said, What's love got to do with it? Is love not, what's love? What's love but a what? An old-fashioned notion. What's love but a what? A second-hand emotion. That's love. <laughs> a 
Exactly. So you're saying work. What's love got to do with work? What's love got to do with it? Rice and yam go together. Right? Wait, tell me somebody's with me. The last, the last outbreak you had was this, the last outbreak you have. God will not make you express another one. Receive it. Spaghetti and beans go together. Okay, okay, final one, final one, final one. Final one, final one. Dami and Sarah go together. But, 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 but work and love, nah, they don't go together. They don't. You see, in the video of Tina Turner's new song, Tina Turner pushes men away. If you watch the official music, she doesn't push men away. All the men are coming, just psh, psh, psh. I don't want none of this. Psh, psh. I don't want your love. I don't want love. But the text that we read today, doesn't push love away from work at all. It puts them together. It begins, if you, if you see it, if the text is put up, you see it. It begins with the ideal of love. Look, I now buy your love. Now I love, 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 love. And then it begins with the ideal of love. And then, unlike Tinatona, it embraces ideas like ambition, ideas like business, like work, like daily life. It embraces them tightly. So, to Tinatona's question, do you know what God is saying this morning? What's love got to do with it? God is saying everything. Everything. Love's got to do everything with it. So for God and for us, love is not an old-fashioned notion or a second-hand emotion. Love is the first and second greatest commandment. That's what love is. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. Love your neighbor as what? As yourself, the two greatest commandments. So think, if we spend most of our lives at work, it is not a stretch to say that that is where we would live out and obey this commandment the most. Make sense? So people, work might just be the primary context for discipleship. You see what Brother Lawrence says? He's a mystic, he works in the kitchen. He was a mystic, he was a great spiritual guy, and he works in the kitchen. Look what he said. He said, the time of business does not with me differ from the time of prayer. And in the noise and clatter of my kitchen, while several personas are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God as if I were upon my knees at the blessed sacrament. The failures and the success and everything in between work enables me to better listen to the word of God, to better obey his commandment. Brother Lawrence. Let me show us something. I want to show us a few statements. You see, the Hebrew word for work in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for work is called avoda. You see, look at it. Look at it all over the scripture. First time. Look what it says. When you, see, when you go to Genesis 2.15 and you read, the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to walk it and take care of it. The word walk there is from the word avoda. It's avad. Actually, it should be adide. Avoda, avad. When you read, but that's, you see, that's plain work. But then read this one. This is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. So that they may what? Avodam, you see? Walk, worship, the same word. Look at another one. Six days you shall avoda. I am giving you the service, the avoda of the priesthood as a gift. Look at another one. But as for me and my household, we will avoda the Lord. Serve. Then look at this final one. Then man goes out to his avoda, to his labor until evening. What do we see here? The Hebrew word avoda jointly means what? Work, worship, and service. You see, seeing it in Genesis 15 shows us that God's original design and desire is that our work and worship and service should be a seamless way of living. 
It is a picture of an integrated faith avoda, a life where work and worship come from the same roots. But so often, we often think of Sunday as worship morning, something we do on Sunday, and then we think of work as something we do on Monday. So while we lift our hands in surrender on Sunday, we throw our subordinates under the bus on Monday. While we rejoice in what Christ has done for us on Sunday, we boast in our ability to close deals on Monday. This dichotomy is neither what God designed nor what he desires for our lives. Avoda, on the other hand, suggests that our work can be a form of worship where we love God and where we want to love our neighbors. Work, worship, service. You know, we like to talk about Joseph. You know, talk about Joseph as a very admirable guy, great guy. And I want you to know about Joseph. Joseph had this great dream. He left his father's house. His, his brother sold him as a slave. And then he went to Egypt. Blah, he did all these things. Spotify did not sleep with women. Blah, blah. And then at the end of the day, he became the prince of Egypt, the king of Like he ruled over Egypt. And he owed him up as a prime example. You see, but what is often lost in that narrative is we talk about a rags to riches story of Joseph. But we often miss what it, one of the primary things about that story. And I want to show us. You see, when Joseph was in Potiphar's house and he did not sleep with woman, why do you think he did that? When Joseph was in the prison and he walked the way he did, why do you think he did that? I want to show you something. You see, let's turn to Genesis 40, verse 6. See what it says about how Joseph viewed his work. He said, When Joseph came to them, so this was in the prison now. He saw his fellow prisoner. He was a prisoner himself, and then there were other prisoners in the prison with him. And then Joseph met them the next morning. You see, when Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. And then what did he do? He asked them, he said, ah, you officials that are in custody with me, he said, why do you look so sad today? Can you see Joseph's approach his work? Thinking of his neighbor, thinking of how he can show them love, whereas he's in the prison. You see, that's just one part. Go to Genesis 45, verse 7. Look what it says about Joseph. You see, look what it Joseph says, But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. Joseph sees his work as saving lives. And see, you say, okay, me, I get the, me meeting my colleagues or meeting my customers and telling them, why do you look so sad today? I get that one. But how does my own work, where I am, in the office that I am, this thing that I'm doing, how does it save lives? How? It's Martin Luther that helps us. You see, Martin Luther exposes scripture. So 145 and 147. And then it's saying things like, you see, um, the food that we eat, God can decide that you don't have to prepare any food or go to the, you know, go to the market to buy raw materials and then make food or bake bread. You know, you see, you just, God doesn't have to do that. God can decide to just supply you bread miraculously. And he has done that before. When God supplied manna, he supplied it miraculously. This wouldn't have to labor. He poured down manna on them. He gave them for 40 years. But God would say no. God will say, no, there are trees and there are plants, and then a farmer will plant them, a farmer will watch them, water them, bridge them, make sure that they grow, he will pluck them, as you see the farmer's work, and then he will take those fruits, he will take, somebody will now collect them, somebody will drive them, take them to the factory, mix them, process them, they become whatever, maybe flour, and then someone takes the flour and he takes them to the bakery, and then he makes them into bread, and then someone, you know, packages them, and then he brings it to shop right, and then you go and then you get them and come. Why would God do that? Oh, look at children. Can God not say, just speak to your wife or just pray to God about children and then the next day you get to wake up and then you just see a baby lying in your cot bed? <laughs> Can God not do that? He has done it before. God did, not, God did not need to use a man and a woman to make children. The first man that he made, he said he formed them from the dust of the ground. He can. But God has said, no, this man and woman will born this one. This one will not grow. Then you will not see one babe that he like in church. <laughs> then 
you will now toast that babe, then they will now come together, then they will now do some things, certain things that what um, um, Toki said last week that they will do. Then after a while, then they will now get pregnant, and then the woman will carry it, and then they will give birth to a child. Why does God do that? See what Martin Luther says. He says, God could easily give you grain and fruits without your plowing and planting, but he does not want to do so. What else is all our work to God, whether in the fields, in the garden, in the city, in the house, in war, or in government, but just such a child's performance by which he wants to give us gifts in the fields, at home, and everywhere else. Therefore, our work, these are the masks of God, behind which he wants to remain concealed and do all things. Through our hands, God answers the prayers of his children. We pray for daily bread at night, and bakers rise in the morning to bake it. This same oats for clothing. God gives the wool, but without our labor, if it's on the sheep, it makes no garments. Humans must share the wool, must spin the wool, must sew the wool into clothes. The landlady who always stood is tenor. Tenor. Don't pray, man. She will stop shouting. She will stop crying. I don't know if you hear the story. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't disturb me. I don't like all this noise in my compound. And then one day, they've been fasting for days. And these guys were hungry. And they are praying. And they are tired. Don't want to look at these fools. You hear them praying. They are praying that, God, may you supply food for us. May you bring food for us. We are waiting on you. Something that we can use to break. And then, you know, you look at them and say, oh, sure. Foolish people. Let me show them. They will think it's God now. She now went, now to go and buy bread. <laughs> she said, we'll move them. She now fling the bread upstairs. Then she now waited. She said, you see now, we'll move, we'll move. They would think it's God. Then I said, woo, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God walked through. <laughs> <laughs> That is exactly what your work is. It is a process. It is a means to which God is saying, God is saying, you love your neighbors. You use the gifts I've given you to serve your neighbors. You are loving me. You are loving others. Think about the chair you are sitting on. My last example. How did this chair? You are just sitting on this chair, chilling. Relaxing, listening to me. Me, I'm standing. You are sitting. <laughs> From forest cut down, tools for felling, vehicle that will carry it, to the mill that will lumber it. If there are no roads that they will drive on, who built all those roads? Do you know how many years it, like, it takes a lifetime. It took, it took me, thousands of people to just make that chair you're sitting on. So someone is asking Dami, I see, I see, okay, 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 but chill, 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 chill. <clears throat> don't we make money to survive, really? Like, I see the good point, but we make, we work to make money. We work to survive. For example, let me give you a good example. Take, you're a business person. This, you be, I'm sure you're feeling small, that somewhere you might be feeling like, like, work for love, work for love. You're a business person. Um, the reason why I started my business is a for-profit organization. Uh, and doing it so that we can make money. Increase capital and shares for shareholder. That is what we are doing here. Take a chill pill. A, if you meet a not for profit, let's say the King K now, Ting Guide. If I ask her, what is the purpose of Team Guide? She can say something like, oh, Team Guide exists to raise leaders from children in, um, in the inner community, for instance. That is the purpose. That's what she will say. But if I ask her, what do you spend most of your time doing, Dick and K? What do you spend most of that? She will tell me raising funds. That's what she will say. But if I ask her, no, but why are you doing it? She will say to what? Raise leaders. But it gets murky. Now let's try it with a for profit organization, someone that has a business. So let's ask, now I know how uh, Dr. Dick Femi, you know all these things. So when I use you, I'm not saying that that's what would be your response. So let's say we ask Dick and Femi now, who is a serial entrepreneur. And then we ask him, 
So, why do you start this business? In a typical businessman, we say, to shove money upstairs to the shareholders, to be good to customers and employers, to keep expenditure down and make more money for my shareholders. Well, look at it this way. If you don't have blood circulating in your body, there's no need to talk about serving or helping those people in need. Blood circulating in your body. It is the same thing with a business. If you don't have profit circulating in your business for so long, your business is what? Dead. But which of us will say when we go out and say, and why are you living, uh, Dami? You will not say, I'm going to live for the purpose of circulating blood. <laughs> How many of you will say that? I know some people are deep. <laughs> so, a for profit should not say that they live for the, they exist to make money. A for profit will say that money is just a generating machine, it's a revenue generating machine to get the capital to raise the money to do what they exist to do. Their purpose is to serve people, to serve employees, to love their neighbors, to love society, to provide opportunities for people to use their God-given gifts in meaningful and creative jobs, to provide products and services that will enable the community to flourish. Profit is a tool, not an end. It is to serve. So you see the problem? The problem is that if we work primarily as a way to make money, or so that people can see that you are good, or so that, you know, any other reason up other than to love and to serve, these are things that you end up doing. Is either you will not work, because if work is a means to make money, there are other ways to make money. You can steal, you can beg, you can be idle, you can do people, or you may underwork. That means laze around, you can pretend to be busy, or you will overwork, burn out, waste your health, abandon relationships, or you abuse work, you cut corners. You bully your employees. But if the purpose of work is to serve and exalt something beyond ourselves, like St. Keller says, then we actually have a better reason to deploy our talent, our ambition, our entrepreneurial vigor, and we are more likely to be successful in the long run, even by the world's standards. So, brothers and sisters, you have had it said, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. But I say unto you today, if I can bake the most delicious banana bread, but I have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I sing the deepest and highest notes, if I can clean floors till they become shiny like mirrors, if I can code five programming languages fluently, and I have not love, I am nothing. If I can close deals at ease and have not love, I gain nothing. Work is a way to love. That's the proposal. But how do we walk as a way to love? What is the process? So, second point. Walk is a way to love. The process. You see, just walking by itself, like we've seen, is a way to love. But Paul says in the text, if, you, if the text is pulled up, but Paul says, love more and more. Say so love more and more. That's the way to love, but you can love more and more. So do so more and more. So is it by, how do we love more and more? Is it by calling our businesses, you know, names like El Shaddai Ketras? <laughs> God is able of Spitu? <laughs> Secret place of the most high security services? <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread bakery. <laughs> Coat of many colors clothing line. John 11.35 Counseling or Rivers of Living Coffee Cafe. Is it like that? Is that how we do? No, that's not how we do. Is it by evangelizing? 
By Bible study in your office, putting the Bible on your desk, putting a text on your screen, prayer meeting in the morning, at break, and at close. You can't just go like that. You cannot go the same way you came. So let's pray. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. Of course, it means more than this, but it doesn't mean less. You know, of course. But many of us in our workplaces, we know this is not even allowed. It can't, it can't, it cannot work. So, so does that mean that people like us, people like you, can't love more and more? Surely the Bible has a lot to say. And in this text, we'll consider three. How do we walk as a way to love? So first of all, all work, all work is a way to love. All work is a way to love. That's the first thing this text shows us. All work is a way to love. So you see, guys, for a long time, you know, I felt that my work has taken time from me, from God. That's how I felt for a long time. You know, all, all too often I viewed my work as, as an obstacle to my spiritual growth. I think that some of you, some of you here. You know, when I was in school, you know, I'd be active in, in, ch- in stuff, in church. You know, they, I even, they even asked me to go and start fellowship on campus. I started it. How many of you heard about it? And that's what happened. <laughs> so, so, I started the fellowship, but then I always have you know, business ideas. I'm always starting one, you know, that's starting one. You know, but, you know, it's always, but it's always clash. I'm always thinking, ah, how can I have this gift to serve God? And then I'm not going to be using it to be, and I'm just doing business. Just doing you know, this kind of unholy things. So, my friends are actually confused. To the point that they now named me, they now called me, they used to be calling me, this guy, confused guy, this confused guy, they now be calling me concept pastor. <laughs> concept, sir. <laughs> you have come again, concept. You'll be seeing a way to use scripture to do business and other things, concept pastor. So, but as I continued, um, and I, one of these, and I started towards the end of my school, and I started something um, like a, I said like a social enterprise, and the aim was to help young people you know, discover lives of meaning, of expression, and satisfaction. You know, school is not preparing people for work, so how can we, how can I help school to do what they're supposed to be doing? You understand that kind of thing? So, I started that, and I called it Leap Labs. Leap Labs. Ask me what's the meaning. Ask me now. Leap Labs. So, Leap stands for, ah, things are I'm shy, self. <laughs> Leap stands for lines in pleasant places. And it's kind of fresh, uh, but you understand what I'm saying? So I had to make it spiritual. So I just put it, Leap Labs. So I started it. So when it was, it went on, I, I was still confused all up in my head. In fact, that Leap Labs let me, in fact, this is one of the major reasons why I ever found out about City Church. In fact, that is how I started working with City Church. Because I reached out to Pastor Femi sometime, and then he, he early, like late 2015, and then he, I followed him, I messaged him, and he went to read the website of my Leap Labs. And then he said, ah, wow, this guy looks like a very, he's a confused fellow. <laughs> but eh, there's something about him. There's something about him. He said, let's meet up. So I met him, and then the first meeting, I said, ah, I have a lot of work to do <laughs> in this one's life. What should I do? He now gave me work. So that as I became the first employee of City Church. But so Pastor Femi thought that he's the one that gained. <laughs> he did not know, even till now, I've not told him, he does not know anything. Is it because he's pastor? So what, <laughs> what had actually happened was that I had been thinking, ah, this thing is confusing me. How do I go out and walk? There's no match. Love and work is not going. So what should I do? I started reading stuff, Tim Keller, this people reading it. This show is not ending. American things, Nigerian things, not blending. So one day as I was reading their website, and I saw, ah, Femi Oshunio, he trained at this Tim Keller, this American meeting. He's coming to now plant in Nigeria. I said, first of all, first, I want scam out. What do you get? I want Tim Keller. But as I read, I said, ah, this guy is legit. So, real life story, you want me to be lying to you? Uh-uh. So, <laughs> so, my plan was that, as he offered me job, my own plan is that, uh, something that me have been trying to learn for many years, how to balance, this person will not teach me. It's not for free, he will not be paying me. 
to learn what I want to go and be suffered and be learning. So that's how I entered. And I started learning. I started learning. I started learning. You know, and I've been sharing some of the things I've been learning with you guys. <laughs> but there's more. You see, because look at this. You see, because there's a bias. You know that there's a bias. Some of you have this feeling. There's a bias indeed. You see a painting of Mary carrying Jesus. And they'll say he's spiritual. But then you will not see a painting of just one woman, uh, uh, Latifa, carrying Aziz. And they'll say that one is carnal, it's secular. It's not a painting, painting. You will be teaching in city kids. They'll say that one is uh, you're doing God's work, uh, spiritual work. Then the next day on Monday, you're going to class, you're teaching children. They'll say that one is secular, it's carnal work. So when Paul says, walk with your hands in this text, walk with your hands, this is what Paul, one of the things Paul is getting at. Paul lived in a time where he rated people that did all these top jobs, philosophers, speakers, preachers, as better people. And he rated those people that did many jobs, non-prestigious jobs, as lower people. So when Paul says, walk with your hands, Paul is talking to those people who are here. Paul is talking to those who are watching. He's saying some of you are about to leave your work because it's not spiritual enough. He's saying no. When God walked in Genesis, God did not create spiritual things. God made sun, material things, moon. God made animals. God made birds. God made plants. Think about it. Most of the people that we are idol in scripture as biblical heroes, they were secular or carnal. Noah was a shipbuilder and a cruise line captain. Abraham was a real estate developer. <laughs> Esther was a model. She won most beautiful girl. <laughs> Daniel went to Harvard and became president of Iraq. God raised up Joseph as the chief operating officer of Cairo Incorporated. You see, in Joseph's secular occupation, he probably saved thousands of people, maybe even millions of people from starving to death. And many of those people that he saved were not even Christians. My point is, the apostles complained rightly when they said, it is not proper for us to leave, to, to leave preaching of the word of God and give ourselves to tables. But I'm saying, those who prepare the tables, who prepare very good meals, can also protest with justice and say, it is not proper for me to leave tables and preach the word of God. <clears throat> That's one. Some of us are about to quit our jobs or are thinking of quitting our jobs because it's not prestigious. Some of you know. It doesn't pay me anymore. But every time, he blends it you don't see shell, you don't see poor. Many times I'll be driving, people with my wife is a Caucasian, a wife. People, I'm driving, people with, people, everybody think that I'm an Uber, I'm Uber driver. <laughs> and they look down on me. You, my wife went to the went to bank and they and they and they greeted us. Yeah, you not come with your driver today. <laughs> like, in, in. You enter you enter car with Uber driver. The Uber driver will start with telling you his degrees. Why? Why is he doing that? Because I want to prove to you that you think. Uh, I went to school. I studied. It's condition. It's condition. I make crayfish bend. It's condition. I went to school, I have this, I have that, I have that, but you know, I cannot. He has to pump himself up. Because that is how we look at those kind of jobs. But you know what? God was a gardener in the Old Testament. He was a gardener. He made, like I told you, when he came in the New Testament, he showed up as a carpenter. In fact, some scholars say he wasn't a carpenter. A carpenter is even too prestigious because he didn't have a lot of wood and trees in Jerusalem at the time. He said, Jesus was probably, the right word to translate that is tecton. Jesus was probably a stone cutter, a mason. Jesus was probably, Jesus was a laborer. He went to sites for 30 something years. He woke up everyone and said, Mola site, Mola site. That was Jesus. That's what he did for decades. Bus conductor. It, it, do you know how hard it is to be a bus conductor? Do you, know the, do you know the control management that is going on? Change issues, bus stop issues. Hey, you not come a bus stop. You come a bus stop. Not this is that. 
Arguments in boss, people just come in the morning, tired from work, arguing. Police check, what we, how would the boss conduct a dodge, all those things? Closing the door, those doors that are. <laughs> all these things can come. All these things, if you, conductor, if you don't have a good conductor, if you don't have a good bus conductor, all these things will combine together to ensure that you get late to work. It will combine together to ensure that you get to work irritated. You know, have you ever tried being a bus conductor before? <laughs> Some of us have. Now, I have plenty of times. You know how hard it is. That driver will say, eh, eh, hold oh, no. Some of them are greedy drivers. You don't have to pay conductor. And I say, eh, maybe I see help me. Just gather money for back. Ah, you should do. Anyway, someone volunteer by what you walk. <laughs> you don't say, oh God, you want to do good things. Hey, this is shut up, you're not giving my change. That's what they do. All this, before you know, someone say this, all these boss conductors say, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> One more. Some of us are about to quit our jobs because it's not paid, because we're not getting paid for it. But you know, many of the work, many of the most important work that we do in this life, we are not get paid, we don't get paid for them. Like cooking, cleaning, repairing, beautifying, coaching youths, raising children. Ah, raising children. Ah, raising. <laughs> I'm a father of two toddlers, I know. Raising what? Children. Temida and I were talking the other day, my friend. He said, he doesn't like when they say um, people were calling mothers stay at home moms. Why are they calling them stay at home? I said, What would you like? Shay, you would like that you call them remote mommies. <laughs> remote moms. You know, everybody's working from home now. So they'll just ask you, I stay at home mom. So what do you do? So I work from home. I work from home. Because everybody's working from home. See how one Christian mother says. One Christian mother says that. Whenever they ask her, so what do you do for a living? So she's like a very, she studied and read different things. She's not doing like, what do you study for a living? Amongst her friends, when she go for dinner party, she'll say, socializing to homo sapiens. <laughs> she's a mother of two. Socializing to homo sapiens into the dominant values of the Judeo-Christian tradition so that they can become the eschatological change agents God has designed them to be for all eternity. Because God says you don't need, you don't need to do that. All work is what? A way to love. All work. So that when you resume at your work tomorrow as a janitor, as a cleaner, you know, you're changing the light bulbs, you're mopping, you're emptying all the trash, and then you're thinking, oh man, I wish I could do more, but what? But what? So remember this. You know, your work is like Brother Lawrence. All work is good work. So you go to your work because you are seeing this now. You are saying, ah, you go to the office. You go to the principal's office. And you say, as you are putting your duster over our photos, you are saying, Lord, please watch over Mrs. Iritiola and her family. As you are cleaning the primary six class, you say, ah, Lord, grant Mr. Chibuzo to teach this student well. Or oh, as you are going to the cafeteria and you are wiping the tables, you say, please fill these children with good food. And when you get to the office, you get to the receptionist area, I say, God, grant this receptionist full-time work that she needs. Let them extend her contract. So that when you're finishing your work, in fact, people will be sending you prayer requests. Your work will feel so rewarding because you know that you're not just working. You're working for God. <clears throat> you see, second... You think we see it for this thing. Hard work is a way to love. Hard work is a way to love. That's another way. Work is a way to love. Hard work is a way to love. Look what it says. He says, minding your own business. Second Thessalonians 3 verse 11 makes it clearer. Second Thessalonians 3 verse 11. See what it says. It says, these people, when you talk about mind your own business, they say, they say, you hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. Look what it says. Listen to this one. It says, they are not busy. They are what? Busy bodies. Like Pastor sang those week ago, what do you say? Busy body, that's what they are. They are not busy, they are busy bodies. Who's Paul talking to? Do you want to know who Paul is talking to? When you have the time after church, 
during your week, or it is Monday and Tuesday, go and Google pretend, just put Google pretend to work and see things that will blow your mind. <laughs> Some, it depends on where you are. Some of you will say, oh my goodness, what is this? Some of you will say, oh, what's your tubes? <laughs> pretend to work, Google pretend to work, or Google look busy at work. You see things like, you see like, one guy did one hour video of fake work screen. One, where you just show yourself opening Excel sheets, just carrying uh, Microsoft Word, just you know, typing things, just doing things, everything, just arranging. One hour. And if your boss comes, he cannot see anything. You don't say, wow. <laughs> Some of us know how to do, you, know, you see things like, there's a kind of face that you can, I mean, you know, if you, if you always look annoyed, you know that people will think that you, you are very busy. <laughs> Just think about it. I noticed this. This he works hard. Though. There's no everybody knows that he works hard. But do you know that Tommy is always having this annoyed look? <laughs> but he works hard. There's no doubt about that. He works hard. I was looking at some people and say, ah, because people usually look at me that I mean I'm playful and people not think I don't work hard. So when I said, I will start practicing this thing. Until when I saw it on Google and I said, ah, ah. <laughs> some of us. You have a particular posture. You know how you can sit in the office? And then you'll be using office time to play a game. You use office time to do your own side also. You're using office data to download movies. You just, there's a way you can sit like this, that nobody. You know how to block, even cubicle. You know how you can. But see what Jesus says about those. Jesus calls them wicked. He doesn't say slothful. He says they are wicked and slothful servants. He says they are wicked. See what Proverbs 18, 9 says. It says, one who is slack in his work is brother to one who destroys. He said, they are brothers. Message, my best guy, Uchi Peter, look at translate. He says, slack habits and sloppy work are as bad as vandalism. He's saying that people who work like this, he said, they are like hoodlums. That's what he said, they are like hoodlums. That you can't be using office work to be downloading movies, and then you'll not be tweeting all these hoodlums that are destroying our. You say, huh? Are you talking about yourself? <laughs> You see, you can't be slack, you can't be sloppy in your work. You have to show up early. No procrastination. You have to have an attitude of excellence. Dickie was saying this about Dickie Olumide the other day when they had this small get together for him. He says the first thing that struck him about Olumide, Dickie, was that when he saw him for the first time, people had sharing testimonies. And then the thing that Dickie Olumide could share was that I just want to praise God that. My, my company, not him, not his side also, my company that he's working for were able to secure the contracts. He said, ah, clean the other. No. Went to meet him after that. Your company, is it like the company that you started? He said, no, I just work there. He said, are you going to get bonus? He said, no. Are you going to get bonus? He said, no, it's just my company that they are working for. And he got it. I'm just happy for them. That was so moving. That was so winsome to him. And that's what he's saying here, minding your own business, be interested in the process by which things are made at your work. The process, be interested in the end product. Don't just, I've done my own part. Send. <laughs> stay, stay jiggy. Stay jiggy. Peace out. No. God wasn't praised. God was not even paid. But God, at the end of six days, looked at his work and said, it is good. They no pay him. They no praise him. He said, it is good. Nothing in nature shows that God is sloppy. Nothing. Yeah. But, that's, but that's God. You're saying, that is God. God is God. You look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. He says, whatever you do in word or in deed, you do to what? To the glory of God. You should walk in such a way that people will see your work and say, God is good. Yes, you can't make sunsets, but you can make photographs and paintings. Do it well. You can't make rain, you can't make plants, you can't make soil, but you can use all these things, bring it together and make banana bread. Do it well. You can make dresses. Do it well. You can make buildings. Do it to the glory of God. You can make apps. Do it to the glory of God. You can make novels. Do it to the glory of God. You can make businesses. Do it to the glory of God. You can crack jokes. Do it to the glory of God. (laughs) 
This is how I go leave my own work. Oh my. <laughs> so a policeman came in front of our car, just me, I'm driving, my wife is in there. And then, and then he said, my wife said, but my wife knows how to handle policemen very well. I don't know how she does. She just said, I know they give you anything. Do your work. Do your work. I know they give you anything. Do your work. She speaks pigeon. Ah. And the guy just said, like, she can speak pigeon. The guy was shocked. The guy first was coming to my side. And he was going to meet the woman. He was going to meet my wife. I said, ah, madam, I know one do my work. <laughs> I know, I know one do my work. Just find me something. I know one do my work. But look at Proverbs 6, verse 6 to 9. Look at what Proverbs 6, 6 to 9 says. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler. Yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? He said, do not be like that policeman. Be like the ant. Be like the ant. If ants can work this hard, can work to the glory of God, how much more you made in the image of God? The last one. Work is not the only way to love. Work is not the only way to love. You know, I said, work is a way to love. I did not say work is the way to love. Work is a way to love. There are other ways to love. Your friendships, your marriage, your family, your church community. The ways to love. Because we have to be careful. Because we know that work can convince us that we are working hard for our families, all the while we are being seduced through ambition to neglect them. We know. We know this. Yes, work is your primary context for spiritual formation, for discipleship. Oh, but your desk should never become your altar. You see, because if you live like this, you live in such a way that you have little margin to love in those other ways. You have little margin to love in those other ways. And look at this diagram. God is from John Tyson, the pastor in New York. Look at, look at this first diagram. This is life to the full. This is how we should live, life to the full. Jesus said, he has come to give us life and give us life to the full. This is fully emotional, fully physical, fully spiritual, everything full, to the full, to the full. This is how we ought to live, full. <clears throat> but look at this next one. So, work is not the only way to love. You need to have margins in your life that allows you to be able to love in those other ways. So if you walk, 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 and make work the central, you will be able to love in those other ways. In fact, it's not that like you're not just be able to love in those other ways. Even this walk that is the way to love, you won't be able to walk well in it. You won't be able to love well because you will bring in your cranky self, you will bring in your, you know, angry self, you will bring in your out of tune self, you will bring in your mind racing self to it. So what do we need? We need to be able to take time. When Paul is pointing, Paul is saying that ambition to lead a quiet life. He's talking about restlessness. You need to make time to rest so that you can build margins to be able to love. But see what we often do. Look at food. Look at the food. No, go back. Go to the first one. This is food tank. This is how God wants us to live. But we don't, you know, we don't live like this. We don't make time to rest. This is when we start to think about rest. When we get to this point, the next one. This, this is when we start thinking. Uh-huh, I need to rest. You keep postponing. Uh, public holiday. Public holiday. I will rest. And when I take my leave, I will rest. You see, but how, how will you be loving between now and your leave? How are you going to be loving between now and your public holiday? So when you now get, when you are almost finished, that's time you now decide to rest. So when you decide to rest, what happens? Look at the next one. This is how you recover. You see, if you wait until that time, what they call burnout, what they call exhaustion to rest, you will never ever fully recover. God wants you to live life to the full, but this is how you keep recovering. So you will be missing in several actions and several opportunities to love more and more. You see, the thing with rest is, we have to start from saying, you know, God walked, and when he walked, finished walking, 
He looked at what he said was good. But he said, God rested. You know God is God. His tank is always full. So God was never tired, but he rested. If God who is never tired, God who walks well and is never tired, rested, and we are made in his image and are to love, love, walk like him, love like him, it also means that we also need to take this rest seriously. That's what Paul is saying here. I know it's hard. Uh, some of us are paid a lot at our work, and so we have to work for it. Some of us don't get a lot of money, so we have to work different jobs in order to, we have to work different jobs, and so we don't have time to rest. It's hard. We work from home, we work from, because technology has made it, we work from home, we work from our toilets, we work from bar, we work from, we work everywhere, work is from everywhere now, so it's harder for us to rest, yes. Oh, you're waking up, you're thinking about work, it's just, not just when you're working, even when you're not working, you're thinking about work, so it's very hard to rest, work is not just on your laptop, work is on your head, it's hard for you to rest, yes. What is saying, God rested and you ought to rest. How do we achieve this? Is it God already made provision? When he said six days a week you should walk, he said, but remember the Sabbath day to what? To keep it holy. The Sabbath is a deliberately scheduled time where we refill our tank so that we can be able to love more and more. What was the Sabbath? The Sabbath is that one day a week, six days you should walk, one day a week you should give it to rest. Six days a week walk, one day a week you give it to rest. You see, this will look differently for different people. Some of us work as doctors, as nurses. Some of us work night shift and all that. But we need to find a way that we're getting as much as we can, close to 24 hours, to make time to rest so that we can love more and more. Because we need to ask ourselves, why did Jesus, why was it that we read the New Testament? Jesus was able to do a lot of miracles on the Sabbath day. Why? Why was it that Jesus was doing a lot of miracles on the Sabbath day? You read and say, on the Sabbath day, he went to eat this person's hand. On the Sabbath day, he went to this world. It's because, see, what does it show us? One thing we can learn from that is that when we rest, God does what we cannot do for us. When we walk, God is doing through us what he wants to do through us. But when we rest, God is doing through us and without us what we cannot do for ourselves. So, guys, ambition to lead a quiet life. At some point, you have to say, I know if I rest, I won't be able to move forward, I won't be able to go far. Elon Musk says that 40 hours is not enough to change the world. We have to be able to do about 100 hours. Marisa Maya says uh, you are, she works at least, Marisa Maya, former CEO of Yahoo, she works at least 130 hours a week. You say, how do you do it? You, say, you have to be able to know when you sleep and how long you sleep. You have to be able to know when you go to the toilet and how many times. You have to be able to know what you eat, and when you eat. She sounds like a slave. But Sabbath means that we're saying to, our, to God, we're saying to ourselves that you are God and I am not. I may not go as far as my colleagues. I may not go as far as this man or this woman. I will not be a sloppy guy. But that does not mean that I will work so hard that I bond other things that you put in my life to serve and to love. Finally, guys, as I wrap this up, work is a way to love. What is the product? When we live like this, what results from it? You see, there are three ways of results, and I'm going to just do that quickly. Three things that happens. Products. There's what results for us, for you personally, there's what results for you, for a community of believers, and there's what results for outsiders. So if you walk as a way to love, if you see your work as worthy in God's eyes, you work hard, you rest, you probably, you most likely succeed, as even other philosophers, as even other people that are not in church are beginning to say, I will do more when we rest, when you put in your work. You'll probably do more, succeed even more by the world standards. But that is one. You see, the thing that Paul gets at here, because you see, at the end of the text, Paul says that do all this so that you will not be dependent on anybody. He's referring here to the family of faith. He's not saying that, ah, eh, you know, don't, don't be responsible. He's saying no. He's saying that 
each of you should, you know, Paul has said that each of you should look to the other person's interest, not to your own. He's not saying that be a man of your own, be a self-made man, no. Paul is saying that, he says that whoever, you know, we're talking about whoever is not willing to work should not eat. In 2 in second Thessalonians 3.10. So Paul is, Paul is, when he says people should not, he's talking about people that, when he says you should be hard work, he's saying, you know, those that don't now want to work hard, those that are not willing to work hard, he said those people should not have sponge on the people that are working hard. In fact, it says that the opposite of stealing, Ephesians 4.28, it says that whoever steals should steal no more, but should work with their hands so that they can give to others. He's saying the opposite of stealing is actually giving, it's actually generosity. Because we know that some of us will work hard here and it will not work out for us. Some of us labor and so hard and there's no way for us to increase our salary and we cannot afford all that we want. Some of us work so hard and we know that COVID will come. We know there are seasons in our business where we don't make so much. So who's going to take care of us? Paul is saying that, yes, the, the fact that we need to see in your life is that you are willing to work, that you have this commitment to excellence, and that when you are not able to afford all that you have, all that you need, the community of believers should come around you to help that person insofar as we see that that person is willing to work. He says, brothers and sisters, that is what we are called to do. It means that as you are working, as you are making money, those of us that are working and it's working out for us. You know, Prosper was sick the last time. He played football and he broke his leg and he couldn't work for months. What did the community of believers do? Please prosper. The community of believers came together and then in the office at work and then some other people in church came together and gave him monthly stipends so that Prosper, who is hard working, who plays the keyboard, who does other, other side hustles, can live even when he's not able to work, can sustain himself because he's willing. That is what happens in family your faith. So as you're working, as you're making this money, you'll not be saying, oh, I can buy. If you don't need something, you don't say, I'm just going to buy. You'll be concerned how you spend the money. Ah, will there be other people who are hardworking but cannot afford, cannot help them? Are there some people that they've lost their jobs? Are there some people who are sick? You'll be working. How can I save aside? How can I give? How can I be looking out for such people in a community? Well, lastly, Paul says that so that you may win outsiders. It means that if we live this way, other people will look at us and say, wow, what kind of people are these? This person works hard. This person rests. This person does not take his work as if it doesn't mean anything. And then, even when this person was not able to work, how was she able to sustain herself? When they fired her, how was she able to work? People will see this and say, he's my sister, he's my brother, he's my fellow Christian, he's my church member. They will say, ah, ah, no, 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 no. This is beautiful. And they will win them over. He says, so that you win outsiders. You win non-Christians. You see, this also means that when we talk about work, we talk about toxic workplaces. We talk about unhealthy workplaces. We talk about all of these places. We know that toxicity does not start outside. Toxicity starts from our hearts. Starts from within us. Starts from how we look at work. If work is your altar, if work is everything you need to do to survive, if all that matters is getting ahead at any cost, breaking anybody, crushing anybody, then automatically the workplace you create is what? Is a toxic workplace. So Christians who work in those places will do what they can. Not the, the, it's not that they always have to quit. They will do all they can to be able to love more and more as much as they can, as much as lies in their power. Sometimes they have to quit. Sometimes they have to seek reforms. But they have to try, how can I do my best to still love more and more here? Christians will go on to start businesses. We will go out and start businesses that are proper examples of healthy workplaces so that outsiders can see and say, ah. So it's possible to succeed in this Nigeria without being a toxic boss. It's possible to succeed in this Lagos without working my staff to death, without denying them of their leaves. But how do we get here? Look at how Paul says it's possible. He said, how, how can we love like this, guys? How can we walk like this? How is it possible for us to love like this? How is it possible for us to walk like this? Is it possible? Who can love like this? Who can walk like this? Who is going to show us an example? Who is going to show us the way? How are we going to learn? How are we going to see it? Like, is there somebody that has done it? Is there somebody that we can copy? Is there, is there a book that we can read? You know, is there an HB, other business review thing that we can see that can teach us how to, how to live, how to love and work like this, that can change our hearts and make us this kind of people? This is what it says in the text. 
He says, but you guys have shown your love. He says, you love all of God's family in Macedonia. But look what he says. He says, what? Well, because God has taught you. God has what? Taught you. God has taught you how to live. God has taught you. How does God teach us? How does God make our hearts able to love like this? You know, I learned here, Tina Turner, in that song, you know, when she says, what has love got to do with it? She continues by saying, who needs a heart? When what? When a heart can be what? Can be broken. So in our work, some of us are heartbreakers. We've broken the hearts of people at work through the way we work, through how we see work. But some of us have, have gotten our hearts broken. And so Tina Turner is, you know, this question, she's feeling that way and saying, who needs a heart at the end of the day when a heart can be broken? You see, when God says that I will teach you how to love, oh, Paul was alluding here to Jeremiah 31, verses 33 to 34. Look at what he says. This is the covenant I will make with people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Guys, when your heart is broken, you know you can't make a new heart. What do you get? You get a transplant. So guys, you see, we, are, we need someone to give us a new heart. Heart that we don't have. Heart that can love like this. What do we see here? What do we say every time in this church? What do we say every time we preach? We say that God, Jesus Christ, gave his own heart to you. He transplanted your heart with ease. He sacrificed his own heart so that you can have a new one, so that you can have a heart that is able to love like this, so that in your walking you are loving more and more. This is how he teaches us. So people, I want us to rise and I want us to go with this heart and this mind and say, yes, for God has taught me how to love. 